So we got, uh, finally got off the train at a uh, little town called Shubin, S-C-H-U-B-I-N, I think. I'm not sure. And this camp had been formerly used by British troops, but the Germans had moved them out and was populating it with Americans. Now, the only Americans in there at that time were those who had been captured in Italy, I mean, in uh, Africa. And uh, so there weren't too many of them, maybe a couple hundred, I'm not sure. So we were the first ones from Sicily in there, and we were mixed in with the rest of them in that one building. Now, there were a number of other buildings around there, but they were not occupied at the time. So, and this, I am told, had been, this camp had first been a boys' camp of some sort. So that's where we were. And this became Officer Logger Fear and Sexy, or Off Lag 64. And could you describe the camp to me? I'm sorry. Could you describe the camp to me and what it was? Well, yes. It, it was a camp. We, the, the building we were quartered in was the big main building. Uh, we called it the White House. And then all around, the rest of the camp were barracks-type buildings. And uh, and back toward the back end of it was a, uh, I don't know if it was a supply building, repair building, or what. But I never got into it. But it was a fairly large camp. And eventually we had about... Uh, a little over 2,000 people there. So, and these were all officers. Now, when we first got there, one of the buildings had some Russian prisoners in it, but it had a, a fence around it to keep them separate from us. And I suppose they were using them as workmen. I remember there was one Russian troop came into our building uh, to do cleaning or what have you, whatever they wanted him to do. And uh, he w didn't want to see the U.S. Uh, didn't want to see the war ended. And we uh, finally got the idea from him he didn't want to go back to Russia because they were going to kill him for becoming a prisoner. <laughs> and that was his feeling. But it wasn't too long. They moved all the Russians out of there too. So it was just Americans. And we never got any more in there except uh, for when uh, the uh, Battle of the Bulge. Then we got a big influx, and uh, they, they filled up all of the other buildings around the camp. I never got to know any of them because they, well, we just didn't get around. Mm -hmm. And did they have you do any work while you stayed there? It wouldn't allow officers to work. That was against the Geneva Convention, I guess. But uh, they didn't allow us to work. They wouldn't, they didn't trust us. They didn't want us out of the camp. If we were out of the camp working someplace, we could have an opportunity to escape. Now we did, we built dug tunnels. I wasn't involved in any of it, but I know we had them. All, and at one point, we had three tunnels going at the same time. But we finally, uh, when the uh, British made an escape and the Germans caught them all and they killed a bunch of them, we got orders 
from U.S. authorities not to make any escapes. So they shut down the tunnel and stopped digging. And one of them was uh, practically completed. But uh, that took care of that. I know we had one guy in the camp managed to escape, get out. <clears throat> it was not a successful escape, but it was to a certain degree. He had, uh, we had uh, acquired one way or the other uh, uh, German marks. And so he conducted this escape by going into the railroad station and buying a ticket to the next town. And at the next town, he'd buy a ticket to the next town. And he did that. He finally, they finally caught him, though, down in Yugoslavia. And I understand the way, how they caught him was a guy happened to sit down next to him who was a German officer. And he, his German wasn't that good. But now, how did you keep these tunnels a secret? Well, we we had radio in the camp uh, by bribing a guard. Uh, I was not involved in any of that. You keep in mind, but uh, by bribing a guard, you can get them to buy a little part here or there, or something or other like that, and somebody in camp would, and would put this together and they made a radio, and we picked up broadcasts off of BBC in England. And uh, we kept up with the news. We knew what was going on. We knew the status of the war. We had uh, our senior American officer was a colonel, Thomas D. Drake, a really nice old fellow. And between him and the German commandant, who was uh, also a colonel, an Oberst, uh, they, I don't know how well they got along together, but I know that they did get together and they'd have a cup of coffee. We got powdered coffee on our Red Cross parcels, and the Germans didn't have any good coffee. Everything they did, I had was ersatz, or false. So he and uh, the Oberst would get together and they'd discuss their problems and what have you and that sort of thing over coffee. It worked out. That way, uh, Colonel Drake could get favors for us and one thing and another, make life a little easier. How easy was it to keep things from German guards? Uh, we never had any contact with the guards themselves. We didn't. How that now there was always two guards that worked together. We call them ferrets, <laughs> but they were, I suppose, they were security guys over and above the regular guards. And they come in and then wander around the camp. And if you saw one of them, you didn't talk about anything. And is this where you were interrogated? No, no, no interrogation yet. We, uh, I think we had been there maybe a couple of weeks, possibly a, a little longer, I'm not sure. Uh -huh. And I and all of us brought up from Sicily, and there were about 18 or 20 of us all together were put on trains and sent to Luckenwalde, which was uh, outside of Berlin. There they had an interrogation camp. 
and that's where we went. They put each one of us in a cell by ourselves and the door was locked, could not get out. This cell was very small, had a cot in it, and just about enough room to get out and walk to the door. Now, on, on the door uh, was a what we call a knocker and a uh, string came through the wall and hung down. So if you had to go to the bathroom, you pull a string, the knocker would fall down on the outside. The guard was supposed to come and take you to the bathroom. And that took care of that. Now, there's a story that went along with it, and I know this was true because I knew the guy it happened with. Uh, by this time, they were getting big bombing raids over Berlin at night. And, uh, of course, they were flying over us. So one night, there was a big raid going on, and uh, Mitchell, who had learned some German in high school, uh, had to go to the bathroom, or he said he did anyway. He starts, he pulled a knocker. Mm. Well, during a raid, the guard's not going to let anybody out. And they did not reset the, the knocker. And they, he could pull all he wanted. It wouldn't do any good. So uh, finally, Mitchell starts hammering on the door. Nothing happened. Then he begins to yell. It's been shashing and pissing on the decker. And what he was saying, he's going to shit and piss on the floor. But to the Germans, a decca was a cover. In this case, it could have been the ceiling. Then they came and opened the door to take him out. And we figured that they wanted to see how he was going to do it on the ceiling. But anyway, he did go to the bathroom. <laughs> now, later on, uh, oh yeah, we were going to look in Valdi. Uh, yeah, they had us locked in these uh, cells. Now, you could not talk to one another, or at least they thought we couldn't. But there was a window high up on the wall. And by standing on the head of my cot, I could look out the window. And Harry Evans was in the cell next to me and I could hammer on the wall or he could hammer on the wall and then we'd both get up and we'd talk to one another out the window. Now Harry is the guy who later became my brother-in-law. Same one that didn't uh, think much of me down in Sicily. But anyway, we were in these cells. I was in there all total 18 days. And uh, so finally, uh, long toward the end, uh, I was called into the office for interrogation. And we were being interrogated by Hoffman Williams, or Captain Williams is what he was. And uh, I had been told that he had lived in the United States for 17 years and he did speak good American English. So 
He was interrogating me, asking me questions, and of course I was refusing to answer. And uh, but he had allowed me to have some coffee or something, and uh, I I was in no hurry to go back to the cell. But he was getting ready to send me back to the cell, and I said, Captain, I said, I've got to be honest with you. I said, uh, I was a pilot. He said, you were? What were you flying? I said, I, <laughs> I couldn't tell him the truth. I said, well, I was flying a Spitfire. He says, uh, you were? I said, See, now, up until that time, he had assumed I was an infantryman with a squad of men. So then he said, well, tell me, how did you get a squad of men into your Spitfire? I said, <laughs> I couldn't think of anything else. I just said, well, that's a military secret. He got so damn mad. He jumped up, he started yelling in German, and, and, and this guard come in the door and he practically twanged to attention. I thought he was going to have me shot. And the guard took me out and put me back in the cell, and that's the last I saw him until the day before we left. And he called me and he said, Look, I know you were in the ground forces. Now, just tell me where you were. What division were you in? I was in. You had to be in the 1st, 3rd, or 45th. Now, which was it? I said, I was in the 1st, because I had that old 1st Division helmet I had. <laughs> so then he let me out, and I went back to, they shipped us all back to off like 64. So we, in our own way, we uh, we got our kicks too. Uh -huh. One that my son here wants me to tell you about, and I will. In off like sixty four, there at night they turned out the lights in the whole building, and uh, it was oh, I don't recall now. I think it was probably about nine o'clock when they turned the lights out. And then a couple of guards would come through, flashing light, flashlights around, checking on everybody, make sure everybody's in bed and what have you. So up on my floor, we were up on the second floor, I think it was, uh, we set up a bridge game on a table. Two, four guys playing bridge, and a couple of guys standing around as kibitzers watching. Now, when the lights went out, everybody took their places. The cards had been previously dealt out, and so everybody picked up their cards. And as soon as the guards came in, somebody said, uh, two spades or something. They'd make a bid. <laughs> And first time this done, this amazed the guards. How do they see in the dark to play bridge <laughs> or play cards? But uh, eventually, I think they caught on. But it was our way of getting even with them. Well, we're uh, coming close to the end, so I want to get to how you became liberated. Could you tell me how you were free from the camps? Well... That didn't come for some time yet. But on January 21st, the Russians were making their drive toward the West, and they were getting too close. So January 21st, 1945, the Germans marched us out of there. And at that time, we went on what I have been told was the longest forced march of World War II. And we marched out of there, out of Poland, up to uh, the uh, Straits uh, uh, on the Baltic uh, North Sea, 
and a uh, Swinamundi, that's what it was. And, uh, and then from there over to uh, Siegel Cow, which was somewhere not too far from Berlin. Supposedly we marked 347, no, over 300 miles in 47 days, I think it was. But before we got that far, though, we uh, ended up at uh, oh, my memory is failing. Another camp, and uh, it'll, the name of it'll come back to me, but. Right now we were put in to this camp. It was well in within Germany. And we were there for a short time and Patton made his move over to the east. Uh, uh, what happened was that uh, he sent a reinforced armored company in to supposedly liberate his son-in-law, Colonel John K. Waters, who later on became a general. But anyway, Colonel Waters was in a camp with us. He had been captured down in North Africa. So, uh, I don't think Patton knew he was there, and reportedly uh, the word went around that it was his intent to liberate his son-in-law, but uh, I don't believe that. But anyway, he got uh, his reinforced armored company, got there, and uh, we had a, a battle in the camp, and uh, over the camp. They were out there shooting in, and the Germans were shooting out the other way, and uh, we were in the middle, and one of the barracks got hit and burned down, and what have you, but anyway. Uh, finally, Colonel Waters and a couple of German guards came out to try to talk some sense into somebody so that uh, nobody would get hurt. Well, an SS guard there uh, shot Colonel Waters. I understand it injured him severely, but he did live. So the next thing that happened was they drove, uh, uh, Patton wasn't on that raid, it was his, his troops. But uh, they drove a tank through the fence and they came in. And we say 1,500 Kriggies took off over the hill. And we did. We, we streamed right out of that camp and running. It must have been a mile or two. Harry, my future brother in law, and I, by this time, had become very good friends. He and I ran, we got on, a, a climbed up on a half track, and uh, the steel rail side of this half track is not very wide. So when you, and this thing was loaded with troops, it was trying to get away, and I sat on the side, straddle that, and it's, it's hard, and it hurt, but then it was worth it. We had uh, some wounded troops laying out in the bottom of it, so we couldn't get down in there. We took off, and uh, the column moved. Now, this column was supposed to have been met by fuel trucks. It never happened. And, uh, but anyway, the column began to run. Uh, we got into a firefight one went along the way and uh, 
most of us jumped off and got behind a tree or something. It was in a wooded area. But finally, it ended and we got back on the vehicles and took off. And, uh, but they were about to run out of gas. So they pulled up to the top of a hill and backed up to the trees and set up a defense. The rest of us, we didn't have weapons or anything. And by this time, uh, oh, and I did forget to mention, Colonel Drake, a senior American officer, had been repatriated to the United States because of his ill health. And our senior American officer now was a Colonel Paul R. Good. And so Colonel Good suggested we all go back to the camp that we had just escaped from. <laughs> and we did. There were no weapons. No, no needs getting hurt. So we did. Well, then after that happened, then the Germans loaded, uh, or the next, that day, then our uh, liberating force got captured and they joined us. <laughs> and so then the Germans moved us all out and, uh, March, we marched out from there down to uh, Mooseburg, near Munich. So uh, we were on the road two, three weeks for that. And uh, by this time, it was obvious the war was practically over. Even the Germans knew that. I know one point we went to a town and uh, as a column went through the town, Harry and I broke off from it and took a side street and went, uh, by this time the weather had warmed up and I wanted to get rid of that overcoat because it was heavy and didn't want to bother with it. So. We went to a house and knocked on the door and we were met by a woman. Now Harry had practiced learning some German and he could use it. So told him we'd like to trade this overcoat. So very hobbindous. We're uh, was Hobbinsy, and so on. Well, they invited us in. They gave us some cakes and some coffee and what have you. And uh, we talked. Just glad to get away from the crowd, you know. But finally, uh, we left and rejoined the column. There's no place else to go, and there's no point in getting yourself shot at that, that near the end of the war. So we ended up down at this camp at Mooseburg, and uh, the war was so close to being over that uh, Patton's armored force came in and liberated us again. This time it stuck. And finally, we were trucked out to uh, an airfield where eventually we got on planes and were flown out into uh, France. And uh, first camp I went into was called Camp Lucky Strike, not too far from Le Havre. And how much did you weigh when you finally were finally liberated? When we got to Camp Lucky Strike, we were given a brief physical. I weighed, I was down to 134. My normal weight at the time I got captured was about 180. But uh, I think all that marching probably took a lot of it off. <laughs> <laughs> 